Hello and welcome to uh, what well, kind of today is a, a combination of section 13 and 14 since I screwed up and didn't post 13 in time. So we're going to finish out talking about television and then we'll uh, begin to talk about uh, social inequality uh, in the media. Uh, so wrapping up what we were talking about with television, we were talking about Herb Schiller and the myths that he had. Um, about how television can control people, manipulate people. Um, and so the fourth myth that he has is the myth of the absence of social conflict. Uh, and in this, what he's saying is that the mind managers, the cultural elites, um, they convey that there's no real social conflict. Of course, there is social conflict in the world. We see Black Lives Matters. We see um, nationalism. Uh, right now, we see uh, where there's, and by nationalism, I just mean that there's there's people that want to take America back, uh, and so they're they're fighting, um, and using all this rhetoric about about pride in the country and and keeping out uh, illegal immigrants and all that. Well, of course, we see conflict on television, um, but what? Schiller really is saying with this is we see conflict but more in terms of like a boxing match, right? Where there's one side against another side and one side's trying to beat the other. And he says we really, we don't get a, an intense examination of social conflict. There's nothing deeper about it. Um, again, you blame individuals, not a social institution. Um, you know, you think about some of the most violent um, relations in the world would be that between perhaps Arabs and Jews. And a lot of us know that uh, Arabs and Jews fight about a lot of religious matters, but we don't really understand the whole context of that. We think it's just, oh, these people have one version of God versus another version of God. But it, it goes way back and it goes into territorial conflicts and land disputes and but we don't really get a, an intense examination of that. Um, we just focus on surface issues. Who killed who? And have they caught the person? You know, we don't look at why this really happens. And of course, the reason for that is because you want to keep advertisers interested. You want to keep audience numbers high. The more you take time to explain these intricate, deep issues about conflict and violence in the world, the longer it takes for you to do that, the, the more likely someone is to just tune out and, and not watch the problem uh, and not understand it. <coughs> Excuse me. So what ends up happening is that... Um, those programs don't make it to air because they're afraid, well, if we talk about this topic, this divisive topic, uh, intensely, we may cause a controversy or stir something up that people are just not comfortable with, and they either pull their advertising support or they stop watching the show. And so Schiller says, look, as long as we, as long as we can keep it more into the realm of like a boxing match of this person against that person, people will watch that, right? But avoid the deep discussion. Um, you don't want to show people, if, if people are trying to manipulate others, you don't want to show them all the intricacies. You just want to make it into a boxing match, so to speak. Uh, the last of Schiller's myths is called the myth of media pluralism. This is pretty simple. And the statement is, choice is unattainable in any real sense without diversity. Never confuse choice with diversity, right? Uh, so last night I go to eat, and it's late. Uh, it's, it's almost midnight, right? And... If you drive around this town, you see all these places that may be open till midnight. So you have a lot of choices, but is there really any diversity? 
you're either going to get a hamburger from Wendy's or McDonald's, or you're going to get chicken from, you know, Sonic or McDonald's. I mean, there's no real diversity there. And the same can be said about the media. You turn on your television, if you have a, a, one of the upper tier cable subscriptions or satellite subscriptions, yeah, you're going to get 200 channels or 300 channels, but how much of it is really different, you know? Do you really need five channels that are just about home and garden stuff? And is it really about home and garden stuff, or is it really just kind of entertainment built around a home and garden interest, right? How many shows can you watch where they flip houses or they renovate a house, right? And there's tons of them on television. Uh, but you see where if something strikes, if some topic or some narrative, if some way of or some kind of like formula for a television show, if that gets popular, you're going to have other people just gobble that up and spit out their own version. So, you know, at one point there were these shows, these reality shows about nannies that came in. There was one show called Super Nanny and then another one called N Nanny 911. The Flipping House shows, there literally at one point was, I think, a show called Flip This House and then another show called Flip That House. They just changed the this to a that. Um, so what Schiller is saying is, look, if your cable provider or satellite provider says, oh, well, look at all this content we can give you. It's a 200-channel package or a 250-channel package. Well, how diverse really are all those channels, right? It's gotten to the point now where can you tell whether a show was on A&E or AMC or Bravo or... Uh, USA or whatever channels. It, it's getting harder and harder and harder to tell the difference now between what show is on what channel. And it's because they're all starting to look the same. So if we shift gears, Herb Schiller is kind of a negative Nancy, right? Uh, for lack of a better term. He's, he's pessimistic. He's looking at things in kind of this classical Marx view of the, um, the media is also used in class warfare for the elites against uh, the working class people. Um, so Schiller's, Schiller has a negative view. And as a counterpoint, I'd just like to bring up Horace Newcomb, who is retired from the University of Georgia. He was um, a, a professor there who directed the Peabody Awards wrote this book called Television, The Critical View. And if you don't know anything about the Peabody Awards, it's one of the highest awards you can earn as a television program. It does not award individual writers or individual actors. Um, it doesn't do things on the individual level. It does things on the entire show level. And what it's doing is it's awarding shows that it feels contributes to society. So it's not necessarily looking for the most entertaining show or the mo most profitable show, but it's looking to award the show that it feels contributed something worthy to society, right? So what ends up happening is you run the gamut of all those shows because uh, sure, you're going to get some PBS documentary, right, that maybe talks about World War II or, or Vietnam or something like that. It's, it's very informative. It tells the audience a lot, uh, and it comments on society a lot. You'll also get South Park, right? You'll get an episode that addresses some topic, and the Peabody judges think, yeah, even though it's using crude humor and and irony and sarcasm and all these other tools and it's an animated um, cartoon, even though that's it, all the case, the main point behind maybe that episode of South Park, the main point was culturally and 
socially relevant enough that it wins. So you'll have shows like The Daily Show is one in the past with Jon Stewart, uh, Colbert Report, um, b- before he went to Late Night, Colbert Report, he had won The Boondocks, this cartoon by this black family. It's it's won a Peabody. Um, so Newcomb has a much more positive take on television and, and specifically what he sees television as is a cultural forum. He sees television as this kind of meeting ground uh, by which we can all come together and discuss things, right? So it's a, TV is a, a uh, discussion space, really. So it, it, some of the stuff he says is we're so focused on finding a meaning behind a story that we forget that multiple meanings are possible, that even if someone thinks, well, that show is just vulgar and crude, someone else may get something very meaningful out of that, right? And so he asked questions of how do we engage TV, or rather, how does TV engage us? How, is, uh, how does TV make us do things? Um, so there's, there's kind of two famous views of how communication has worked in the past. And the first would be transportation. And that we can talk about that and talk about things like hypodermic needle theory, about how, how a, mass, um, a message travels uh, from one person to another via a medium. So in this case, we're talking about TV. Transportation then would be focused on, well, how does a message move through TV to make someone respond? And that's a traditional transportation method of uh, model of, of studying communication. How do you impart a message you have to someone else? Um, and what are the effects when that transmission occurs? What are the effects that come out of it? <coughs> Newcomb is uh, much more interested in the other way that we can look at communication, which is a form of ritual. Uh, ritual, we all know what ritual means. It's going through the same process, the same steps over and over. Why? Because there's some kind of simplicity and peace to it. Right? We do this ritual because it, it clears our mind. It clears our soul. Um, it helps us to commune and come together. And when we look at communication as ritual, we're not focused on the traveling of a message through space, but rather how communication maintains society over time. So ritual shows us a representation of shared beliefs that we have. In this kind of thought process, Newcomb is applying it to television, saying television is... It's very much part of the ritual, you know. People will sit down and watch a show every Wednesday night, uh, right? A show that they're interested in. Um, and so, Newcomb is saying that watching TV is is part of a ritual behavior. But this talk about rituals and communication actually predates what Newcomb is talking about. It goes back to James Carey, who's this kind of famous communication scholar who was interested in the ritual side of communication. And, and his most famous quote that a lot of grad students use in papers, you'll see it time and time and time and time again, <coughs> excuse me, is that communication is a symbolic process whereby reality is produced, maintained, repaired, transformed. In other words, um, how do we know what we know about our world? So how do we know that um, that I'm trying to think of uh, that there's this place called the Delta in Mississippi in West Mississippi. How do we know that exists? How do we know that's reality? Because someone's told us, right? Perhaps we went there and saw it ourselves after someone told us. Maybe uh, when we talk about the legend of the Delta and how the blues comes out of the Delta, that gives us meaning 
about what the delta is. Someone who doesn't have that understanding, let's say someone is an exchange student, they come to Mississippi and someone drives them out to the delta, they don't understand the history of the blues coming from the delta. But you do. Why? Because someone has told you about that reality, right? Communication maintains society and reality, right? So we keep things status quo, we keep things chugging along, moving along because we communicate. So society becomes maintained, you know, well, we like this, we don't like that, right? Um, that's maintenance, and that happens because we communicate. Repairing, whenever something breaks down, maybe there's a school shooting or a shooting in some, some public space, and our world kind of gets torn to crap. You turn the TV on and people are talking about it. Why? Because they're, they're looking for answers. They're looking to see how do we stop this? How do we repair what's happened? And finally, reality can be transformed by communication. You get enough people talking about a topic. And let's just take something like uh, same-sex marriage. If you had asked me 15 years ago if this country would legalize same-sex marriage, I would have no clue. But obviously today, society as a whole is more comfortable with it. That's a transformation, whether you want to view it as such or not. The American culture definitely had it in its mind, you know, two, three decades ago, marriage is just a man and a woman. But because we've seen and heard and witnessed um, people who are seeking those same-sex relationships, because we've talked to them, because we've heard them talk, people swing around and, and tend to th change their mind over time. And that's why what it means by communication can transform society. And so both James Carey and Newcomb would agree a ritual act of communication has to be seen as a process rather than a product. I'm not trying to get a 30 second ad completed that will convince you of something, right? That's a transportation kind of thought. Well, let's just slap together a commercial and put it there on the air. The ritual act of talking about stuff, talking about the issues in the gay community, talking about the issues surrounding opioid abuse, Having dialogue, discussing those things, having television show about those things, that's a process more than it is a specific product. And so Newcomb feels like almost any TV text can act as a forum in which important cultural topics can be considered. So everybody watches this you know, show that comes on NBC or HBO. Everybody watches that show. And then afterwards they talk about it and they talk about that episode and what's being done why did you like what this character did why did you not like what this character did and it begins a conversation piece that we can have to to talk about what we value culturally and what we don't value right So Newcomb proposes a study of the flow of television. He's, he's not only just interested in single shows, but rather how one show flows into another show, how it creates this kind of uh, ensemble, this whole thing that comes together. And so he, he encourages people to watch large strips of TV to determine and look and see, well, what are the social issues that are getting talked about the most, right? Um, <coughs> Watching large strips of TV, uh, you can find that out. He suggests that audiences appear to make meaning from television by selecting that which touches their own experience 
and their own personal history. Why do we like the things that we like? Because it resonates with us some, somehow. It either touches on our own personal experience, it reminds us of our own personal history, and so we tend to flock towards that content. In the end, Newcomb says, look, if television is a cultural form, it's a place where we can get together and talk, then acknowledge and understand that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the answers. The point is, is to raise questions. That's more important than, than really answering them, is continue to ask questions and try to learn every day, right? So he encourages that TV should be a place that introduces social issues to people, regardless if it has an answer to them in the end. So we're going to shift now and go and catch ourselves up here and do section 14, which is social inequality and media representation. What does that mean, social inequality in the media? means looking at issues of race, okay, uh, of special classes. So some opening questions that I usually start with is, do you think demographics such as race or gender or age shown in the media accurately reflect the real, real world? So for example, let's take, um, let's take a typical TV primetime, how about Grey's Anatomy, right? So an opening question to all this could be, does a show like Grey's Anatomy, does that accurately reflect numbers in terms of race, gender, age? Is the number of characters that are black on Grey's Anatomy, is the percentage roughly the same as the percentage in the real world? So when you think about that, then you have to think about whether groups are underrepresented or overrepresented. And what stereotypes exist within those groups that are being kind of perpetuated. And why do you think those stereotypes and under overrepresentation exist? So when we have these beginning questions that I've just pitched to you, really what we're talking about are issues of inclusion roles and control, right? Are images of race included in the media? What's the breakdown of that? Is it an accurate reflection? Issues of roles, okay, well when minorities are in these shows, what is their role? How are they portrayed? And then the issue of control, okay, well if we have a cast that um, is almost all white. Well, who who signed off on that? Who, what writers, what directors got together and decided who or how the representation was going to lay out? Right? How many black characters do we want? How many Hispanic characters? How many men versus women? All these things are issues of control. So, even when we see, let's say, an African American uh, in a television show and there's a negative portrayal of that African American, ask yourself, who did that? Who put that character in that position, right? The person who did that has the control. Just some notes uh, about inclusion and diversity. Until World War II, there was uh, very little representation of blacks on radio or television. So you didn't see many on TV. Occasionally you'd hear African Americans on radio. Um, in fact, you could see a lot more or you could witness a performance by um, black actors more so on radio than in other places. Um, the history of radio is kind of famous for having some black casts 
uh, doing radio dramas and whatnot and little skits and things. Excuse me. I had a big yawn there. But um, it didn't necessarily translate over into television that well. And even on radio in the early days, if you had African American uh, people portrayed in the show or in the drama or whatever, it's usually as an entertainer or servant. We still see that kind of continue out throughout the 1940s and 50s. Blacks are there, but they're in stereotypical roles. They're either comedic foils, they're entertainers, much in the way of like a minstrel show kind of deal. Um, so they're there, but they still don't take center stage. Uh, and yeah, when they're when they're on screen, they are subjugated. Uh, you can tell that their scenes in those early days, um, that those scenes are going to be of the butler, the maid, uh, the dim-witted simpleton. Um, so very stereotypical roles. The 60s and 70s, we start to see some change in that. Why? Because this is the era of civil rights. Uh, more blacks are featured. By 1970, half of all dramatic TV programs included a black character. So you start seeing more acceptance of that. In the 90s, blacks made up 12% of the actual population in America. And at the same time, 11% of the characters on prime time television were black. 9% of daytime characters. And then in 2004, what we see is we see cable expands rapidly, right? You have, uh, we've already talked about the Telecom Act of 1996 and how that created so many changes in the world of media. Well, one of the things that resulted from that was an expansion of cable channels lots of different programs and channels to choose from, right? And also, as that was happening, more and more people were starting to understand how they needed to market shows and advertise shows to black audiences. So you put in more black characters. And by 2004, the number of black characters in prime time was at 16%. That actually exceeded the actual percentage of the uh, black population in America. So by the time we get to 2004, what we see is that in terms of just numbers, who appears, you know, who shows up on screen, um, when we look at 2004, you have more black characters percentage-wise in their own little television world. You have more there than you do in the real world in which we live. But that doesn't mean segregation doesn't still exist. Of course it does. If you look at a lot of shows, you'll, you can still determine that a show will have a, a heavily white audience um, and white cast, or you have the reverse, a primarily black cast and, and black audience members. So groups are still segregated out, right? And of course, one worry that people have about if there's a show on and there's only one black actor, one black character, um, the fear is that then that, that actor character gets labeled as a, the token. In other words, tokenism is when you have one character of color, let's say it's a, a, a black kid, Right, That black kid is used to speak or represent an entire ethnic group. So the voice of that one black character becomes the voice of every black person in the world. And that's not fair to the character. Um, 
and I said well, I was focusing on black kids. So the kind of funny thing about talking about tokenism, this is why the black kid that is in South Park, the black character, his first name is Token. His last name is Black. So South Park is actually kind of saying, okay, here's our token black person. He's literally called Token Black, right? Um, many black characters in 2004, when they were looking at these programs, there was a big study in 2004, and so a big content analysis of television. And so that's, that's why these numbers keep coming up. This year keeps coming up. But we saw that many black characters in 2004 were part of shows that featured predominantly minority casts. So you had networks like the WB and UPN that would have programs with black characters in them, but, but that was because it was an almost entirely uh, black cast. So, so in other words... You had shows that were being marketed towards a black audience, and so the majority of the cast members in that show were black as well. We call this pluralist television. When you have a show that seems to only have one race, the same race, um, in there. So that, that's uh, pluralist. Okay. So what about other ethnicities? Um, of course, the, the largest minority in America right now, Latinos, there has been slower growth in representation on TV and film. In 2008, 6% of characters on TV were Latino. Compare that to 15% of the American population at the time. And so what you see is that there, by percentage-wise, they are more underrepresented compared to reality, okay? You're going to start noticing that change. As Latinos, Hispanics um, start driving more and more and more of the American culture, you will see that change on television. You'll see that catch up. <clears throat> Primarily, why? Because television is all about advertising and finding new markets to advertise things to. And so you have this this uh, wave of, of immigrants that have come into the country or are coming into the country and eventually they're going to have money to spend and advertisers want to make sure that that money goes to their product to buy their product and so that's the natural kind of evolution that this will take is and, and people have already done this they started to realize that there's a a Hispanic market out there on television that or, or the Hispanic market out there that is watching television and has some disposable income and advertising has to figure out how to appeal to those people. Talk about Asians, they're the least represented minority by actual number. Again, there's a difference between the actual number on television and the percentage of characters. Right, so in this study in 2008 that was done, there were only 33 characters in primetime that had some kind of Asian background. Right, so in terms of just, just numbers, that was low. But again, if we look at by percentage, who's the most uh, underrepresented, it would be Latinos. In 2008, 3.8% uh, of characters in film and primetime uh, TV were Asian compared to 4.5% of the population at that time. What about other forms of media that we can talk about? Well, there's also minority underrepresentation occurring in music videos, magazines, advertising, but Again, because of trying to make that dollar bill from, from immigrants, you're starting to see some equality level out in advertising. Uh, so you have in, in your television commercials, starting to see more and more Latinos in those. 
And again, it's because there's a product to sell and there's a market that needs to buy. In video games, the percentage of portrayals closely resembles that of actual population numbers for whites, blacks, and Asians. But again, by percentage, this huge underrepresented group of Hispanics and Latinos, they are very much uh, underrepresented in video game culture. Um, there was a study at the same time as, as that we've been talking about, found 3% of characters in these video games were Hispanic and of course 15% of the actual real po uh, actual real population 15% is Hispanic and so we get the last slide of the day audience segregation still exists so we talked about how you can have all black cast or all white cast or all Latino cast and that's pluralist television. <clears throat> but not just the cast numbers, or uh, cast uh, members are segregated. Also the audience is segregated. And by that I mean what does one group of people like to watch versus another group. And so we see in 1996 only one of the 20 most popular TV shows in black households was among the top 20 in white households. So there's there's not a lot of agreement in 1996 about what the good shows are, right? You have black audience members who are watching one set of TV shows, white members are watching another set of shows. By the year 2000, that number of shared top 20s, that increased to eight. Then also, one week in 2010, there was one program that was listed in the top 10 for both white and black households. That's called audience segmentation. Again, it's you're breaking down um, television ratings, uh, looking at um, which populations are watching which show, right? So. In other words, uh, there's clearly a show that black people like and they watch, white people not so much, and then a complete reverse for that. There's going to be some shows that seem like they're, uh, that they are, I'm trying to think of a good word here. Let me just repeat what I'm getting at, because I, I think you get this, audience segmentation. You have shows that mostly white people like to watch, shows that mostly black people like to watch. So, you know, Friends in the 90s. I heard a lot of my white friends talk about how great of a show Friends was. Never heard too many of my black friends or my Asian friends talk about how great the show Friends was. Why? Because these different groups are watching different things. All right, so that wraps up um, our kind of combo lecture for today. Uh, thank you for your time, and sorry if I'm a little scattered in there. I'm really sleep deprived right now, so it's really easy for me to begin a statement or begin a thought and then just kind of lose it right in the middle and try to have to rebound off that. So I apologize. Um, I've had a lot going on lately being in this theater production, and uh, I just have not had a lot of sleep. Uh, you're college students. I'm sure you understand. But I will see you in class.